Hello, how's it going? Um, Hello, very well, sir. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome um, Alan, Alan McCullough, and the Chief Executive of ANIFPO, and Harry Wick, Chief Executive of um, ANIFPO. And I'd like if you could take maybe 10 minutes to brief the committee, and after, after which we'll take an opportunity to ask uh, some questions. Okay, well, Mr. Chairman, members, uh, thank you very much for the, the invitation uh, to come and give evidence on the UK Fisheries Bill. Um, some background, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Um, we go back to 1973 uh, when, well, what we would describe as some clever manoeuvring by the then European Community Member States around the UK's entry terms of the EEC gave those Member States a huge advantage uh, for the last 40 years over fishermen here in Northern Ireland. Uh, essentially, to this day, it provides the EU fishery fleets with an exploitive relationship over UK and Northern Ireland fishermen, which has come back to haunt the present in what is a powerful way. That relationship uh, was christened all those years ago the Common Fisheries Policy. And the British Government at the time knew what it was doing, uh, but considered fishing expendable to achieve other national objectives. The statistics arising from that decision are now familiar. The UK is allowed to catch about 40% of the fisheries resources within its own waters, whilst other countries catch 60%. The EU fleets fish around six times as much in UK waters as the UK fishes in EU waters. Uh, there has been nothing balanced, fair or reciprocal about these arrangements, especially when compared to the arrangements in other co coastal states outside the common fisheries policy. We believe Brexit will present a unique opportunity for the UK's fishing industry. And as an independent coastal state, we will control access to UK and Northern Ireland waters and ensure local fishermen get a fair deal on quotas. We will revive coastal communities, bringing immediate and long-term opportunities. We will grow the industry's role as world leaders in the sustainable fisheries management. And at the end of the transition period, the UK will become an independent coastal state. Within the Fisheries Bill, we welcome powers for the UK to set its own quotas and control access over who may fish in UK waters and under what conditions. Uh, being an independent coastal state will allow greater representation amongst all the administrations, including the Northern Ireland Assembly. The Bill itself correctly promotes sustainable fisheries management. We welcome the Government's commitment to using science, data and information to inform decisions on fisheries management. We welcome the Bill's commitment to an ecosystem-based approach on fisheries management. The Bill, of course, will provide much more flexibility compared to the Common Fisheries Policy. We welcome the introduction to the new climate change objective in the Bill. And the Bill, of course, seeks to establish a duty to create fisheries management plans to fish at sustainable limits for all stocks. And again, as industry, we welcome that. The Bill seeks to strengthen, to demonstrate the government's plan for co-management, and that's management uh, between fisheries managers and the departments, between the fishing industry and, of course, stakeholders. The bill is right to forecast an important role for secondary legislation, Mr Chairman, and that's where, in future, the Northern Ireland Assembly uh, will come into its own. We welcome the bill's intent to grant equal access rights to the UK fleets fishing anywhere in UK waters. The bill sets ambitious but realistic measures to minimise discards. And Mr Chairman, the government must not back down on its promises to UK fishermen. It is vital that parliamentarians, including those here in the Assembly, maintain pressure on the government to ensure that the potential of Brexit for UK and Northern Ireland fishermen is not traded away as part of a deal for another industry. The Prime Minister has delivered encouraging words, and in a speech last month, he set out plans for the trade negotiations with Brussels. So he said that fisheries negotiations, and I quote, must reflect the fact that the UK will be an independent coastal state from the end of this year, controlling our own waters. The Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, when launching the Fisheries Bill, said this new Fisheries Bill takes back control of our waters, enabling the UK to create a sustainable, profitable fishing industry for our coastal communities while securing the long-term health of British fisheries. So finally, Mr Chairman, we clearly welcome this committee's and the Assembly's commitment to a sustainable and economically viable fishing industry here in Northern Ireland by contributing to a vital legislation framework 
that supports all sectors of the industry. The industry we represent has proven to be resilient in the face of significant challenges from the EU. We are not blasé about the work that lies ahead, but we are confident about the prospects for our industry and the contribution it can make to the Northern Ireland economy. Thank you for the invitation, uh, Chair. I, I, I won't repeat uh, what Alan has said because uh, that, that, that summation is right in the money and I fully endorse uh, the comments he, would, he has made. The, the only thing uh, that, that I would add in consideration of the bill, I, mean, I consider it uh, a, a picture frame, a framework from which, whilst it doesn't necessarily directly address the issues that concern the Northern Ireland fishing industry, it certainly gives us a, a platform from which to address them in future and with secondary legislation. There are one or two caveats to that though. Uh, the bill is by no means final, so whilst we don't know, while it's not final, we don't know what the picture will look like, so it'll be very difficult, or there are challenges certainly, in us trying to ascertain or predict what issues we might face with it further down the line. And it also has to be considered, and it's being formed in the context of negotiations between the UK and EU as to what our future relationship looks like. So we have an idea of where we want the picture frame to sit. We have a, a, an image of what that picture is going to look like becoming clearer, but there is some uncertainty around areas that we may miss that may not be included in the picture. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, up. Do you want to ask okay. Us? Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, kind of caught me on the hop there. <laughs> uh, thanks very much for your presentation. Uh, it was interesting. Uh, just given Boris Johnson's uh, premise to go back on his word and change his deals, I, I'm just not sure I, I would be be confident that that he or the, or, or the Conservative government will maintain any promise that they have given. But t time will tell. Now, just a number of questions. We we've obviously been meeting different, we've met officials and, and others today, so some of the questions Question. will be repetitive because uh, it's, it's always good to get from the industry's point of view. Well, just in terms of the opportunities that additional quotas would offer the industry, uh, because we were asking this of the officials, you know, will the industry be able to cope uh, with additional? Quotas, you know, is it ready, prepared uh, to, 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 to be able to fish uh, and, and catch more fish in, 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 in a new scenario? And secondly, it would be useful to get uh, an industry's point of view on the impact, potential impacts. Because I mean, I asked the officials earlier on, you know, it's positive about new quotas and fire fishing, but there's a lot of potential negatives. One being uh, new immigration policy. That, that may have an impact on your ability to, to do what you like to do. And the other is, I'd like to hear your uh, analysis of the impact potential checks will have uh, on the produce, uh, or particularly within the processing industry, and also potential tariffs. And then you talked about welcoming the climate change. You know, maybe if, from the industry's point of view, can you give us a bit more detail of how you see the climate change aspect of the bill impacting on the fishing industry. And then just the last thing, because we, we had a bit of a discussion this morning about the, I keep hoping I pronounce it correctly, the Voisinage Protocol. Uh, so just your thoughts on that as well. well th thank you very much, Mr. McGregor. There's a <laughs> quite a few questions there. So, um, <laughs> Sorry, did I, did I, I, I beg the chairs and patience uh, as, as, we, as we will answer them. In terms of uh, quota use, the answer is direct yes. Um, as far as we're concerned, the very first thing that should happen come the 1st of January next year is the end of a discriminatory regime called the Hague Preference. The Hague Preference was built into the Common Fisheries Policy uh, since 1983. Um, it was designed to protect communities all around the northern part of these islands that were uh, particularly dependent on fishing. But when it actually was triggered in 1990 and 1991, we in Northern Ireland quickly found that this mechanism that was supposed to be there to protect us actually discriminated against us. And um, I don't want to recite all the examples, Mr McGregor, but the one that stands out for me is just on one species of fish, which is cod, which has become rather iconic over the years. 
and uh, since 1991, Northern Ireland fishermen have lost somewhere like £50 million pounds worth of cod that we've just had to surrender to our colleagues in the Republic of Ireland because of this Hague preference regime. Now, that will end. That has to end because we're out of the EU. We are no longer part of the common fisheries policy. So will that fish be caught come the 1st of January next year and during 2021? Of course it will. And going forward, um, of course we need to build capacity into the industry, and that includes adequate infrastructure at the, at, at the, at the coast. Uh, but as we've always said, the strap line is, give us the tools and we will deliver, and we'll deliver for the Northern Ireland economy. Um, in terms of the negatives, Mr McGregor, and the immigration policy, this clearly has been a, a big problem. Uh, for us now over, over, over many years. The negative publicity that the fishing industry has unfortunately got has drove people who traditionally would have sought employment on fishing vessels away. That's combined with a whole much bigger issue, which is the whole social change um, within, within Northern, Northern Ireland and elsewhere in terms of the careers to proceed or progress. But the immigration policy that was announced um, in, in London last week, um, I think the jury's still out amongst the fishing industry. Um, we still have a big issue about within the UK about allowing vessels of skilled and specialised skilled sorry, crewmen from non-UK countries to come inside the 12-mile limit. But certainly we believe that the immigration policy at least gives us focus, it gives us direction as to where to direct the next stage of the campaign that we can address that issue to. Um, in terms of checks and I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to, 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 to Harry in terms of the protocol. Clearly we're very interested in how the protocol is going to work. Uh, the Joint Committee is going to have a lot of work to do. Um, I understand that some of the discussions in Brussels this week is actually this term talks about talks in terms of actually what the Joint Committee is going to be allowed to do going forward. But there are all sorts of anomalies in there that we need to be very careful of. And one of them being, our understanding is, to come the 1st of January 2021, <clears throat> those fishing vessels that are based in Northern Ireland uh, will be British registered ships, largely fishing in British waters, landing into a part of the United Kingdom. But it may be that when they land into this part of the United Kingdom, because it's British fish, they may have to pay tariffs, has been suggested. Now, we've been told, given some comfort, that that wasn't actually the intention. I hope it's not. That's the job of the Joint Committee to iron out, and uh, we look forward to urgent clarification on that amongst, amongst other points. If, if I could uh, just add to, to one or two of the points Alan raised on the issue of quota. Because the fishing industry is managed sustainably, it's managed in accordance with the best scientific advice we have, we are accustomed to pretty huge swings in the amount of fish of any particular species you can catch in any one year. Some year it swings up to as much as 70% uh, and our most economically important species, nephrops, we've seen a, a 40% decline in the past two years. Yet, yeah, So the, the catching capacity for us to uh, achieve uh, an influx or to capitalise on a, on a new influx of quota is absolutely there and we would look forward to the opportunity of doing that. With respect to immigration, I am probably a little less, well, a little more pessimistic than Alan would be in that regard. I, I see the immigration policy as stated by the UK government as being wholly appropriate for the majority of Northern Ireland and wholly appropriate for uh, the vast majority of the fishing industry. There is no clear route for us to bring in individuals from around the world on which we uh, now rely. There are some options for us to explore in, in, in gaining a route, but we've been down this road with the government uh, for, for, for quite some time now, and none of our options in the past have, have, have proved successful. So I am very, very wary of, of being given false encouragement uh, in, in that department by the UK government and I would very much like to see Northern Irish government do whatever it can to bring the matter into its own hands, even though I appreciate that that is legislatively very, very difficult. In terms of the Northern Ireland Protocol, there is a real opportunity for Northern Ireland, but it's entirely dependent on the status of the broader trade agreement with Europe. If we do have a free trade agreement, 
then the advantages offered by the Northern Ireland Protocol really fade away. And uh, we, we will not have any kind of advantage if there are trade tariffs as a result of an uh, agreement between the UK and the EU. Um, Northern Ireland gets to the point where, through the protocol, it's exempt from those tariffs, then there are real opportunities to make Northern Ireland a, a hub for the fishing industry in the UK and to uh, increase the amount of business uh, that, that currently happens in Northern Ireland. There are risks to achieving that. The Scottish industry has a very, very powerful lobby and they certainly wouldn't like to see that uh, happen. There are big interests in England that, that, that wouldn't like to see that happen. I don't believe our colleagues in the Republic of Ireland would like to see that happen. So if Northern Ireland is to have an advantage, we really need to fight our own corner very, very hard. The issue with climate change is, uh, th this is an area where I feel that the fishing industry's achievements are very much under sun. Uh, we welcome climate change being brought onto the agenda for the fishing industry. We, we welcome climate change being brought onto the, gender, the, the agenda in, in broader society. It's important to remember, however, that the fishing industry as a protein has the lowest carbon footprint out of any of the proteins, and that includes tofu, that includes corn, beef, chicken, uh, lamb. We're already ahead of the game uh, in that regard. We are constantly driving for efficiency improvements, which I suppose improve the bottom line for our members, but also have, because you know, we, we burn fuel, also has advantages for the climate. If we look at some of the issues that, that we already address, so carbon sequestration, uh, shellfish, uh, scallops for example, scallop shells are 12% carbon. If you look at what the UK, the UK shellfish industry catches in terms of carbon sequestration, it's the equivalent of 1.1 million trees. Now, it's even better than a tree, so you can find examples of shells, take core samples that are 8,000 years old. So that carbon that's sequestered through fishing and if it goes to land, when it goes to landfill, it's sequestered for a very, very long time indeed, or by comparison, you know, the benefits of trees only last for 25 years, and then after about 80 years, you know, they're, they drop off. Other, other initiatives in the industry, we are investigating using nephrop, uh, carapace nephrop shells to replace microplastics. Uh, you could also use nephrop byproducts as a substitute for plastic in, in food wrapping that's completely biodegradable and has antimicrobial properties. So the issue of the environment, the issue of climate change is one that we in the fishing industry have gripped very, very strongly. Um, we welcome any kind of legislative support that, that helps us achieve the goals that we all share in this regard. Uh, do you want to discuss poison now, Dan? Well, Happy to do that. Um, just finish off the points on, on climate change, Mr McGregor. Uh, the Chair hopefully has received a letter from me inviting himself and the committee uh, down to the coast. Um, I hope the committee can accept that invitation soon. And you can look forward to you coming to see actually in real action what Harry has, uh, has, has just described. Uh, like in terms of sustainable fisheries and climate change, Mr McGregor, there is nobody Nobody more interested in the sustainability of fish stocks than fishermen. Because after all, if we don't have any fish stocks, then we won't have a fishing industry. And that's the bottom line. And uh, Harry, I've actually come to the Assembly this afternoon, Mr Chairman, from a meeting across in Appy in Newforge, uh, where we were discussing the next phase. And what, and it was an industry-led project, but includes partners in Appy and in the department, which some years ago was formed to look at gear trials selective fisheries, um, etc, etc. The discussion this morning was about moving that on to the next stage. And, and as we start to look at management measures around marine protected areas, which no doubt will be coming to this committee in the years ahead, what we're actually doing to address it, those areas as well. In terms of the vaginage issue, Mr McGregor, uh, that was a serious issue. Um, I think it was a matter of sincere regret in October 2016 when the High Court in Dublin um, advised us that actually the Vaginage Agreement, the exchange of letters back in 1965, uh, was actually, actually contravened the, the Irish Constitution. Um, and of course, we, we encouraged uh, the ministers in the Republic and our own, our own people to seek an urgent resolution to that. Um, time went by, uh, but clearly uh, 
this time 12 months ago it, it, it was resolved. Uh, do we want to see a, a return to a situation where we have a hard border uh, down even the, this side of the IC? Of, of course we don't. Uh, and going forward, I think we need to put things under perspective uh, that depending on the fishery, depending on the stock, depending on the port, of course there is a significant reliance in fishing in Irish waters. But just to give the committee, Mr Chairman, some, some indication of where the priorities lie, Northern Ireland's fleet overall takes about 80% of its catch from UK waters. So that leaves 20% that comes from Irish waters. Uh, on the other hand, then you look at some of the stocks that Ireland have an interest in, mackerel, uh, pelagic stock, their most valuable stock, 70% of that is taken from UK waters. Uh, Nephrops langoustine is their second most valuable stock. 40% uh, of that is taken from UK waters. So clearly it's in everybody's interest moving forward uh, that we find uh, an equitable deal, a fair deal, that addresses the discrimination and the imbalances that have been imposed on Northern Ireland fishermen uh, for, for, well, for nearly 50 years. Okay. Thanks, Alan. Uh, William? Thank you, Mr Chairman. And you're very welcome. And it's good to see a wee bit of optimism. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Because I, I'm an optimist, I would believe, even in the agriculture and the farming sector, um, with all the doom and gloom, farmers out there are still positive, believe it or not, you know, very positive. But in relation, uh, and it was mentioned, I think, to Philip earlier, in relation to COD or yourself, uh, and the issues around COD and the restraints you're under, that will change, I presume. The also was an issue that I always thought was disgraceful, the disregarding of fish already caught that had to be put back into the sea. Uh, in relation to that, will there be changes or will that still have to adhere to those sort of rules? Well, Mr Irvin, thanks very much again for your questions. In, in terms of cod, um, it was in the year, the year 2000 that the RIC was the first European waters to be subjected to uh, cod recovery measures. Um, and those measures effectively continue until this day. Um, I suppose the question is, have they been successful? Um, and that can only be measured by the best available science. And uh, back in the year 2000, the total allowable catch that was set for cod in the IC was 2,100 tonnes, uh, which itself represented a very significant reduction uh, compared to historic figures. Uh, 20 years later, the TAC for the same stocks, 257 tonnes. So we'll leave it to yourself, Mr Irwin, uh, to members to judge if those measures have been a success or not. Clearly, I would say they, they haven't been. And one of the reasons they haven't been is because of the rigidity of the common fisheries policy. And with leaving that policy and developing bespoke uh, management tools that are bespoke for the, for the IIC and the other waters around these islands, uh, we can be more flexible in our approach. Uh, we can look at annual negotiations and decide what is the best tools that can be deployed in order to ensure that we can rebuild the cod stock and sustain all our stocks. I think it's worth pointing out as well, and we were reminded of this at the meeting earlier this morning, that ICES, which is the International Council for the Exploration of the Seas, that annually assess fish stocks in all European waters, um, over the past um, few months have actually come out and said now that the recovery, with this word recovery of cod stock, um, is less to do with actually fishing pressure and more to do with other environmental factors. And what ICES have basically told us is that the management tools that are already in place um, should have worked some years ago, Mr Chairman, but because of climatic change and issues that are beyond our control in many ways, that has actually stymied uh, what is called the recovery of some of these stocks. In terms of discards, there is no fisherman, Mr Irvin, in their right mind wants to throw over the side of a trawler uh, valuable protein, valuable food, especially in a case when a lot of the world is going, is going hungry. Uh, the discard plan that uh, became European law was actually a, a UK idea uh, supported by, by Ireland. Regretfully, as it was adopted by the EU, um, it again is a policy which needs to be urgently reviewed. Um, and of course we're relieved that within uh, the draft UK Fisheries Bill there will be a maintenance of the discard plan, but it provides again the flexibility to allow us to develop a system which is more flexible and which ultimately will work and achieve the desired outcome. Uh, am I right in saying that in relation to COD, 
there was different opinions uh, scientifically. I thought there was a recovery in Stokes or Claude. Am I right or wrong on that? Well, again, you look at the advice over the past few years, we, we have seen that the, the, the TAC, the total allowable catch again for Claude this year, uh, was in the IC was cut by 68%, which was not good news. Uh, but when you have senior fishery scientists in the UK actually admit that the advice published by ICs and the models that are used to power that advice are not fit for purpose, then there's clearly something wrong in the system. And there's general agreement, and hopefully Harry can say more about this than me, there's general agreement across the board, be it within the scientific community and certainly the industry, there's a, that there's a focus that's needed here and a lot of hard work to address this. Okay. Uh, uh, absolutely. On the, on the issue of COD and I suppose the false dawn we had with, with, with COD recovery, an awful lot depends on the temperature of the water over the winter. And if that temperature isn't cold enough, then the cod don't reproduce to the same extent. Um, what we've experienced is warmer sea temperatures over the years, a, a reduction in, in cod reproduction. But what we had a series of a couple of years ago was colder winters. Uh, that really gave us a bit of a false dawn in, in terms of recruitment into the stock. So we had, uh, we had a blip, a uh, positive blip, uh, and that blip has now uh, passed through and all those fish are gone and we're back to the, 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 the state where we were before where the warmer winters have, uh, have taken their effect on the reproduction of the cod. With respect to this garden, there are really two different kinds of uh, this garden that, that need to be addressed. The first is the unavoidable catch of juvenile fish. So fish that are too small for market, fish that fishermen don't want to catch uh, themselves and everyone agrees should go back until they, they have the chance to become adults and reproduce. We already take a number of measures uh, to avoid catching juvenile fish. We're, we're engaged in a gear trials project and we have been for a number of years now to try and come up with different methods that allow these fish to escape from our gear before they're caught. And we are seeing some success in that field. I think over the years, everyone can agree that we, we've made significant progress. The other kind of fish discarding uh, is, it is what's called high grading. So if I have X amount of quota to catch, I would go to see, catch a species of, of, of fish that would be a range of market values. Uh, the, the, the bad practice uh, in the bad old days was that the ditch, the, the lower value fish, fish again and only retain the, the high value fish. Now, that is the practice that we absolutely need to stop, and that's the practice that, uh, that a landing's obligation or discard ban should be focused around uh, preventing. It is not one that responsible fishermen uh, engage in. It is certainly more a problem of the past than it is a problem of the, the present because there's, there, there, there's much less tolerance in the fishing community now for that kind of practice than there has been uh, in years gone by. The juvenile fish issue, I think, it is one that industry and science is working in collaboration to tackle without the need for uh, excessive legislation. Certainly. The, the, the issue I have with the current landings obligation is that in some quarters uh, a successful landings obligation is seen as mountains of juvenile fish dead on the quayside. That's not what people should be looking for. What people should be looking for is changes of behaviour and that's what the Northern Ireland fleet is starting to exhibit. So we have fishermen now uh, will talk to each other at sea and uh, indicate that actually this particular area that I'm fishing at the moment where we're coming across small whiting or we're coming across uh, juvenile whitefish, we need to move on. Uh, so we're starting to see those changes in practice and that's really, really encouraging. So I would agree with uh, Alan that the landing obligation at the minute is not fit for purpose and it, it does need a review. But I would also agree that there is a, that there, there is a necessity for a landing's obligation of a type to exist. <coughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, just to, to finish the remarks on the d discards and landing obligation and the work that's been done 
here in Northern Ireland for some years, and it's, it's something it's, I, I believe sometimes we're, we're very poor here in Northern Ireland at, at promoting the positives and the good work that's already been done. And it's not very often people will hear me refer or quote uh, a former European uh, maritime commissioner uh, and a good news story. But I remember a few years ago sitting in Brussels and that commissioner turned round in front of an audience and said, you know, I hear stories from all over Europe about what fishermen are doing in terms of improving their gear, reducing discards, working towards sustainability. He singled out Northern Ireland. He said, Northern Ireland, you guys don't just talk about it, you deliver it. You deliver it. And that's a really positive headline to be taken away. Okay. okay. Um, Post Allen and um, uh, Harry, I want to just pick up on something. See, in terms of the, the quota distribution, um, would you feel that under the, the new, arra new arrangements that uh, we would get our fair share of the quota allocation when you look at the quota management rules? And what, for example, if there was dispute between the other? Regions with regard to allocations. Well, yes, um, I think when you when you go round the coast and you ask fishermen why they voted to leave in, in June 2016, people will come up uh, with different answers, Mr. Chairman. But certainly, a fair share of, of the available quotas is, is is the headline one. There are extreme examples, not on our own doorstep, but in in the English Channel, uh, where. The name says it all, the English Channel, but yet England or the UK get 9% of the cod in that area where France gets 80% of the cod. So clearly there's headline issues like that. Coming close to the home, I've already mentioned the Hague preference. The Hague preference applies to also to fighting, to place. Uh, we would assume that that mechanism is going to fall and that the discrimination that that automatically puts in place and has put in place since 1990 will go and we will get a fair share back right away. However, the reality is that something like 70 to 75 percent of the IC is what some people will call British waters. That leaves about 25 percent will remain European waters. The easy one would be to say uh, that we will go in in the future and demand 75 percent of all the fish stocks uh, that are in, in, in the IC. But we do share these fish stocks with, with other member states. And in the future, we will share it with Ireland and, and, and the rest of the EU. Uh, so they do need to be managed with, with care and with jointly. Nevertheless, um, the example that I, I have in front of me is the one with Haddock. Haddock has become a very important stock uh, locally over the, the, past, the past number of years. At the minute, Northern Ireland fishermen get a share of about 48 per cent of the entire Haddock quota that's allocated in the IC. Uh, when you look at some of the papers that refer to zonal management, uh, which is the phrase that will be used to distribute quota, uh, then we we should be getting around 80% of the TAC. Now, I would say that we're not inventing the wheel. Uh, this has been done before. Um, and of course, that one, one uh, reference that people will, will point us towards is the agreement between the EU and the Kingdom of Norway, which dates back to 1980. And then there was a serious discussion uh, between the EU side and the Norwegian side as to how fish stocks, particularly in the North Sea, uh, should be allocated. And the zonal attachment theory was, was, was ruled out again. It was accepted by the EU side. And in addition to be accepted, the EU agreed that there would be um, a rebalancing of fishing effort within each other's waters. In other words, that the EU would have to give something up. This is the new equilibrium that we're talking about. The UK will become an independent coastal state. Under that, we are subject to inter existing international law. And that international law allows the UK and it allows Northern Ireland to claim back a fair share of the natural resources that are inside the UK's exclusive economic zone. Um, and just before we move on round, do you see, um, if, I know, if you have any assessment, I'm conscious that we heard figures earlier that over 80% of our, um, our landings are, 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 are fish is exported beyond the north. Um, and have you any assessment of in a, in a no deal situation about the tariffs, about the delays, or about maybe not being accessible, what impact that might have on the industry if, there, if we end up in a no deal situation? If uh, I can address your, your, your first issue, first of all, of quotas, uh, I understood your question as referring to the allocation of quota within, within the UK. Yes, yes. yes. Sorry. Uh, what we absolutely must avoid is this. The Brexit dividend, as it's informally known as, being allocated according to the territorial waters of each of the 
devolved administrations. The, the Northern Ireland zone is very, very small by comparison, and it does not reflect the activity of the Northern Ireland fleet. So for it to be divided up uh, uh, according to square miles of, uh, of territorial water would be pretty catastrophic for us uh, by comparison that we, we could have by other methods. The two methods that my organisation would endorse are, first, uh, allocation along existing FQA lines. So if you own, let's say a fisherman owns 2% uh, of the particular quota for a species in an area, any, any uh, Brexit dividend that comes along, he would expect 2% of that as well. So every, every quota holder gets his share of what was brought in to the pool by virtue of the quota, by, or uh, by virtue of the size of the quota that he, he already possesses. Uh, of course, we would have to consider the non-sector, and I would expect that initial allocation to be top sliced uh, pro rata for, for the vessels that don't use uh, FQS. The second method uh, I would endorse uh, is, is the opinion of my organisation that no fisherman or fisherwoman in the UK should be worse off as a, as a, as a matter of Brexit, is that quota is divided equally among fish and vessel licence holders and then is allocated to organisations like myself and Alan's to manage on behalf of our members because we're the ones that sit closest to it and can see where the, the, the most pressing needs for, for extra quota are and where the most benefit can be gained. The issue we have, the issue we don't have that the rest of the UK has is an advantage of being a small country in that we work very, very closely with the non-sector boats and indeed in the past both our organisations have worked uh, to support the non-sector by swapping or, or, or giving up some of our quota to them so that we can keep those boats fishing. So as a result you'll find there's an awful lot less dissent within Northern Ireland about how quotas should be allocated than you would find in other areas of the United Kingdom. Uh, you'll have to remind me of your second question. Um, the second question was in relation to um, we export around over 80% of our... Yep. Uh, have you any assessment of the impact on the industry here if we didn't have a UK-EU uh, deal around fisheries? Well. I would be expected to be protected by the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, in, in that instance, if there was no deal. But as I mentioned earlier, the, you know, the, the Northern Ireland Protocol isn't a given. It's, it's something that's going to have to be fought for if it's to apply to the uh, fishing industry as well. What I am fairly confident in is that the demand for Northern Ireland's product is not going to go away. It is. It is unrivaled uh, in Europe in terms of exports from other parts uh, of the world and that's evidenced by uh, recently there was a, a competitor for our langoustine come into the Spanish and French markets called the Argentinian Red. Uh, that saw a real peak because it's a cheaper product but actually in recent months we've started to see our product rise to the rise to the fore again based on the fact that it is superior. So. When you're selling a high-end product uh, and the demand for it is there, I think I would certainly expect consumers in France and uh, Spain to be very dissatisfied with, 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 with their logistics chain if that logistics chain placed artificial constraints on, on, on them being able to get a product uh, that they have a, a real demand for. My organisation does an export. Uh, Alan's does, so I would, you know, see he's a, he's a better authority in this area than me. Just a bit, apologies, Chair, for misunderstanding your question about the quota distribution, but um, the, the written evidence that I've supplied to the committee, Section 9, uh, deals with that. I, that's what it was drawn. <laughs> so my apologies for that, and it's really, I think, echoes what, what Harry said on, on, on that issue. Um, trade tariffs in particular is something that we are familiar with. Uh, we have member vessels, vessels that are owned and operated from Northern Ireland that are already landing their produce into third countries, uh, most notably Norway. Uh, so we're used to uh, the additional documentation and the tariff issues there. Uh, nevertheless, we are clearly very reluctant to see that expanded across the rest of the fleet, uh, but we are ready for it. Uh, now, as Harry has said, uh, we have the Northern Ireland Protocol in place. 
Um, my understanding is that does protect us from a no-deal situation. Nevertheless, there are a lot of details still to be worked out in that. I've already referred to one of them, uh, where as UK registered trawlers, uh, the entire fishing fleet in Northern Ireland were being advised might, might, when they land their catch here at home, be subject to tariffs, which is a peculiarity that clearly the Joint Committee uh, needs to overcome. Uh, the protocol does suggest that any product that's been brought uh, from east-west, uh, from GB into Northern Ireland, could be subject to, to, to tariffs as well. And again, that seems an absurdity when it's Northern Ireland boats possibly landing in England or Scotland are bringing their product home for processing, all of which is sent back to the GB market. Now, I get it from, from discussions that clearly when the protocol has been signed off, there are details like this that were clearly not taken into consideration. And we would expect going forward uh, that, that that will be uh, ironed out. Um, issues about uh, trading into the Republic of Ireland and then that product crossing the land bridge to go back into Europe is another detail that still needs to be ironed out. So there's still, there still are issues, uh, but you're quite right, it's probably well, not more than 80% of the seafood that's landed in Northern Ireland is, is exported beyond uh, these six counties. Uh, most of it goes into the GB market, uh, but there's still a sizable proportion goes into the EU market. And as an exporter, I suppose the best example I can give Mr Chairman was that in May of uh, May every year, the, the world's biggest seafood show is held in Brussels. And uh, that year, in 2016, before the referendum, we went round some of our customers in the show and we just asked a very simple question, that if the UK was to vote leave, will you still be my friend? Will you buy seafood from Northern Ireland? <coughs> and uh, people tended to look at me, Mr Chairman, somewhat bemused and said, well, why would we not buy it? If the quality is good and the price is right, we will buy it and business will find a way to address these challenges. And just very briefly before we move on round, see in the context of us um, getting um, additional uh, quota for here, um, would you be confident that our fleet and our infrastructure would be sufficient to absorb that there? The fleet and the industry has contracted. Mm. There's a difference in the meaning between the word contract and declined. The fishing industry here has not declined. Mm. Um, in terms of moving forward, there clearly is a lot of work to be done. Uh, there's investment needed in the fleet and uh, there's investment needed in the infrastructure. Historically, members of the Assembly, Mr Chairman, would ask a question, um, what is the value of the seafood sector to Northern Ireland? And the answer that's usually wheeled out is that, well, there's about £25 million worth of fish landed annually in, into Northern Ireland. If the question was changed slightly, as in what is the value of seafood caught by the Northern Ireland fleet and landed any place, the number shoots up from about £25 million to £70 million. Now, we want to bring some more of that £70 million back to Northern Ireland, and that's before we even start talking about what the windfall from Brexit might be. Unfortunately, the infrastructure that we have, primarily along the county down coast at the minute, does not cater to bring that extra product home. And that's why there are several ideas, including the one of a new outer harbour at Kilkeel, to provide the infrastructure that we can bring that seafood home to create employment, to pay taxes, to help our economy. And just very quick then, would you be then be concerned from a financial point of view that we're out of the um, FF and there's no uh, clear indication from the British Treasury as regards uh, funding or support or replacement to that there? I think we're, we're pretty confident that there, there, there will be a replacement. Um, of course, we don't know the shape of that replacement mm -hmm. yet. But, and I don't, I'm making a point here that fishermen have never benefited the way farmers have from the common, common agriculture policy. There's no single fish payment. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, there's help, as you quite rightly say, Chairman, through uh, e EMFF and, and, and its predecessors. But there's, there's no fisherman wants to be going to government with their hand out looking for help. We're very optimistic about the future of this industry. And I will say it again, that give us the tools and we can make this industry work uh, with, 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 without subsidies. But certainly we're in a place at the minute where we are competing with um, our colleagues in Ireland and other parts of the EU. And we know that they will get assistance going forward to help them address the challenge of the UK leaving mm. the club. Uh, likewise, I think in that sense, we will need assistance too to help us uh, 
refocus and, and prepare for the opportunities that lie ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, if I can add the point that that assistance is very, very important. There uh, is a regulation under the UNCLOS United Nations Law of the Sea that, that states if a nation cannot capitalise on its own fish stocks, then it is obliged to let other countries come in and take advantage of that opportunity. We do not want to be in that position. Yeah. We would certainly welcome any help uh, for, for, from any source that would allow our fleet to be in a position where we can capitalise on the extra opportunity via infrastructure investments, via various other forms of assistance for individual businesses. Thank you. Um, I'll move on around here, Morris. Thank you very much, dear. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Very interesting. Uh, you've alluded to, to COD, but I was searching through my pack there. It had disappeared and it's back again in all the notes I had on it. I've gone with it. Uh, but I, I, I can recall when I was reading this here that there is no reliable data for COD available at the minute. Is that correct? I would suggest, having spoken to the scientists this morning on this very issue, I would say the science is there. It is the it is a mechanism through which that science is assessed uh, that is uh, inadequate. We conduct cod surveys annually, so we have one uh, ongoing at the minute. We have a fishing boat that is dedicated to go out and find cod uh, and record its presence. We also have uh, proposals uh, afoot in the future to do acoustic surveys. So. Uh, Fishing vessel sonars now are, are, are so advanced that you can actually attach one to a boat and it'll tell you what species of fish you're looking at. So we can actually we can actually turn the vessels that, that the target haddock, so very closely related to cod, we can turn the vessels of the target haddock into survey vessels uh, for cod as well as they go about their, their normal business. Yes, there are improvements. Uh, the science at the minute is adequate could be better, but it's good enough for the job. What isn't good enough for the job is the criteria on which that science is assessed. Okay, can I, can I think if, if I just can add to that, yeah. Mr. Bradley, it's, um, it's like maybe the problem that you've just experienced with your, your computer. Sometimes you put information out and in and nothing comes back out again. And um, there's, 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 lots, there's lots of data out there. Uh, but th this is what we've been told by higher <laughs> fishery scientists. That, but the, the, the advice is only as good as what goes in in the first place. And if here, especially in Northern Ireland and the IC, we have been caught in a situation for the last 20 years where we are discouraging fishermen to catch cod. We're basically telling them, please don't catch any cod, because we need to do all we can to make this stock recover. So you're putting information into the computer every year which shows less and less cod being caught. And the computer then interprets that, the program interprets that as less and less caught in the sea to start off with. So hence the comments that I referred to earlier from senior fishery scientists in, in the UK. This assessment, this model is not fit for purpose and it needs to be overhauled. Yeah. The other thing about quotas, quotas have yet to be established. Uh, I know and the bill itself has yet to be, to be finalised. Uh, but do you see a situation where, where, where vessels registered in the UK but birthed outside the UK will be able to fish in UK waters using that scenario? No, I'm just I'm trying to... Uh, uh, these maybe are what is called uh, flagships in the industry, which mm -hmm. are UK flag but are probably owned in, in other parts of the, of, of yep. the European Union. Um, and I think that is a, is a very, very interesting subject. Um, it's one that's already covered by uh, what is known in the industry as the, as the economic link. Uh, where there's various mechanisms there to, to, to make sure that value uh, from what is UK quota is returned to the UK. Um, that has been an operation for some years. It's debatable as to whether it um, has been good enough or not. Uh, but certainly the, the understanding I have is that going forward, the UK will at the very least look to reinforce that economic link to make sure that more of the quota that's caught, UK quota is caught actually contributes to the UK economy. It does feed into this issue again, Mr Bradley, of the lack of infrastructure, uh, because we do have vessels that are owned and operated from Northern Ireland that are simply too big uh, to use the fisheries infrastructure that we, that we have here. And that's one of the reasons that they take that the seafood and land it um, in, other, in other parts of Europe. So again, by improving the infrastructure, 
we provide facilities that those businesses can bring their seafood home to Northern Ireland, uh, which again is good for the economy, it creates jobs in the coastal communities and builds on the tools that the Fisheries Bill uh, hopefully will provide for us. Well, that's right, to you, Vice Chair. That's very apt because we had a presentation earlier uh, when we were told that the, there's a, a capital grant application done for the three harbours in County Down, so maybe the infrastructure will improve in time good. for Brexit. Good. We will certainly Thank you, Vice Chair. <laughs> Uh, uh, Claire and John, but before we do, just following on, is, w Morris, were you asking about what the point that we talked earlier uh, in relation to fishermen from particularly England selling their quota? Was that the answer that you were giving, or is that something totally different? That's selling, not what I was asking. Selling their license. I know where you're coming from, Vice Chair, and, and that was a, 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 an item that was raised earlier that some of the Welsh fleet. Would sell their quotas elsewhere, or sell their license, sell their license. Sell it, or if it's, oh. it's something like yeah, that. Is that a problem? At the minute, in Northern Ireland, no. I suspect if it was going to be a problem for for us, we would have started to see some activity on that front uh, already. That's not to say it won't happen in the future, but at the moment, there are a number. Uh, there, there's probably as many licenses on the market at the moment as there has been. Uh, for, for the past few years and they're moving very slowly and they don't seem to be being bought by non-UK interests. So I'm not unduly concerned about that at this moment in time, but it's very, very difficult to predict the future in, in fisheries and it certainly would be a risk that, that I would like to see closed off with a robust economic link okay, uh, before you. we get too much further down the line. Thank you very much, Claire. Sorry. Thank you, Vice Chair, and thank you very much for your, for your presentations. Apologies for being a bit late in and missing the start, but when I come in, it was good to hear uh, mention that the UK government has used the fisheries as a bargaining tool before, and just marrying that up with reports that were coming out last week when we're hearing that it's potentially a bargaining tool again, when we're hearing reports coming out of Downing Street that um, that there's no economic benefit to the UK and our fishing industry. Um, so that certainly causes me alarm bells um, but maybe I, th I think quite a lot of where I was wanting to go was has been asked there recently uh, I'm maybe trying to look again at the, the licensing process that is being um, looked at uh, maybe just get a wee bit more of your thoughts on how that license and enforcement powers may be rolled out and um, how that would work uh, if you see any potential problems with it but looking specifically at a domestic uk market i know that you meant you, you you've already identified that like the scottish fishing industry is a is very powerful it has a very strong voice um but the fishing industry throughout the uk is very different in each region um and given that we do have the smaller coast, I suppose, within all of that, do you see any sort of development happening or any potential development happening that we could have a very competitive internal market to access and the licensing? There, there are, are two issues I see with the points you've raised. The first is that if it becomes apparent that Northern Ireland does have a competitive advantage and that Northern Ireland vessels do have a competitive advantage, I would expect to see the demand for Northern Irish licences from other parts of the UK uh, increase uh, fairly, fairly dramatically. So if there is an advantage in being Northern Irish, a lot of people will want to try and be Northern Irish. The second issue I see with what you raised in terms of enforcement and vulnerabilities is uh, the Isle of Man, uh, Isle of Man waters. Now, with the legislation as it stands at the minute, uh, a non-UK vessel can access uh, Northern Irish waters and, uh, sorry, not at the minute, as it would stand post-Brexit, mm -hmm. uh, a non-UK vessel could ac access uh, Isle of Man waters and fish there perfectly legally. Now, when they do that perfectly legally, that's fine, but there is a real vulnerability there for uh, illegal, unreported, unregulated uh, fishing, IIU fishing as it's called, in the form of misreporting. So claiming you caught fish in one area when in actual fact you caught them somewhere else. Uh, that is a particular vulnerability that I would like to see uh, guarded against because 
I used to be a fisheries uh, enforcement officer in, in a previous job. It was my job to board fishing vessels around the UK, inspect their catch, uh, ins inspect their compliance with EU legislation. Um, my experience in that role has given me very, very little confidence that uh, vessels from certain countries in Europe will behave honourably when it comes to this issue. So that's a particular vulnerability I'd like to see closed off. I think of a, a way, Vice Chair, responding to Ms Bailey's initial comment about um, the, the bargaining tool. Not, and that, that is a real, real concern, but there's a, there's a, a couple of points we may have to make on that. Um, I hear this all the time. Fishing is unimportant, and uh, it'll be traded away, for example, for the, the, the city of London. That, that's like comparing apples and oranges. Uh, like if it's, if it's considered by those commentators to be so unimportant in the UK, clearly that's not the case within the EU at this minute in time. And people, uh, even if they watched the Andrew Marr show on Sunday morning, might have seen the, the French European minister saying that they would bring the talks on a trade agreement to the, a standstill if they don't get their way uh, in, terms, uh, in terms of a fishery deal. So it's clearly very, very important to the European side. And it makes me wonder if it's so important to the European side, clearly there's something there that we need to look at and get back, is, 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 is the bottom line there. The reality is that the EU has a number of uh, trading deals with, right across the world, and uh, there's not one trade deal that the EU has with any other country in the world which basically demands that the EU can get access to the natural resources of that country. And fish is a natural resource of the UK. So for the EU side to be arguing that we should have uh, basically the, the same access to your natural resources as we had when you were a member of the club, to me there's something flawed with, 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 with that argument. And carrying on with Harry's point about um, trade, quota trade, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, th this is one of the benefits of the UK Fisheries Bill, and after all that's what we're here, Mr Vice Chair, to give evidence about t today. That's the primary legislation going through Westminster. And it gives the Northern Ireland Assembly, the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Assembly power then for secondary legislation. And, and clearly then within that we can fine tune fisheries policy to suit the specific circumstances here, here in Northern Ireland. Now when we look at quota management and the trade in quota they've got particular issues uh, within the English context which do not exist here. So within the fisheries bill, you see an enabling powers there that would allow um, the minister, the secretary of state, to do things that will suit the English industry. It doesn't suit here. And I don't think there's any suggestion uh, that we're going to change the way things are done here. Nevertheless, that bill gives you good people the opportunity to fine tune fisheries policy to make it work specifically for Northern Ireland. And that's a good thing. Thank you. Claire, are you finished? Yeah, thank you. John? <coughs> uh, Deputy Chair, thank you. <coughs> Can I, uh, Deputy Chair, apologise for being late also. I'm at another meeting between 11 and 2 today and I'm to be there. Um, and sorry I missed, uh, but I will say at the, the outset that, that I visited Kilkeel one day, um, not that long, was last August, end of last August, early September. And um, I, I do understand that whatever the proportionate size of fishing as an industry or part of the economy, I, I do fully see and understand that uh, it would have a tremendous, any change that would have a negative change would have a tremendous adverse effect on a town uh, and a surrounding area, um, e economically and, and socially. The, the questions I have that have already been touched on in relation to this bargaining chip, so I'm going to ask more directly. Have you been, especially during the time of, of the absence of, of a local assembly here, um, have you been given any reassurance at all by the GB side that fisheries would not be used as a bargaining chip in an overall trade deal um, against something like, for example, the financial services sector? I'm keen to know if Westminster have been able to afford any such reassurance. And secondly, can you reassure me that, that you're convinced that um, turning one jurisdiction, if we call it that, into five? or six if you cut the out of mile, and I assume we might have to do that, um, won't come with its own very serious challenges in relation to processes that might come forward, uh, regulations, protocol, um, and therefore a knock-on effect to supply chains and, of course, shelf life. Well, 
Mr Blair, thanks for the questions as I, as I would have expected. Um, they're very interesting questions and very straight questions and, and they deserve answers. In terms of the first one, guarantees, no. Certainly I haven't been given a specific guarantee that, else. That, the, that the industry uh, won't, won't be, be traded away. Um, all I can, can look at is the, the Prime Minister's words, the Secretary of State's words, and um, a comment has been passed earlier um, on, on, on what we can or cannot uh, read into them. N nevertheless, the, the, the way I look at it, Mr Blair, is from a, a GB UK pol political point of view, the fishing industry has never been in the headlines as much as it has been now since probably the 1970s uh, when we had a cod war with Iceland. Um, it has really become a totemic issue in terms of how successful or otherwise Brexit is going to be. And the sense, and it is only a sense, it's not a guarantee that, that I have from politicians in London, is that there is no way that they can afford uh, to, sell, to sell the UK fishing industry out. Um, there is going to be a compromise. If there's any negotiation, there, there, will, there, 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 will, there will be a compromise, but that will be against the background that the UK is, under international law, an independent coastal state. We are not inventing the wheel here. There are other examples out there, and I've already referred to Norway, and clearly our aspiration is that we end up in a, in a, in a space similar to what Norway has successfully negotiated with the EEC or EU uh, some 40 years ago now. Um, in terms of the challenges uh, that internally within the, the UK or these islands that we have with uh, four plus two in terms of devolved administrations and crown, crown dependencies, that, that is something that, that takes up some of our time. Um, Harry has already referred to issues with the Isle of Man. Uh, clearly we look towards Scotland. Uh, we're very dependent on fishing and waters around Scotland. Northern Ireland, Mr Vice Chair, only has 5% of UK waters. So traditionally, Northern Ireland fishermen have had to travel all around these islands uh, to, make, to, make, to make a living. They have bought fishing opportunities in the North Sea, um, in the west of Scotland. And it's that nomadic nature of the industry over many years which has caused us to be so <coughs> resilient. Uh, but clearly there is a concern that, that going forward, Mr Blair, that the Parliament in, in, in Edinburgh uh, could bring in a rule uh, that only navy blue ships with a, with a white stripe painted down the side of them uh, can fish in Scottish waters. And, and that's clearly where, where we need in Northern Ireland uh, to be very, very strong in, in, in resisting uh, that kind of approach. Okay, so thanks for that. Can I ask an addition, Deputy Chair? Um, it's, we, we know that the <coughs> undercurrent uh, systems some of the Northern Ireland fleet, fleet fishes in uh, some of what is well, what will be EU territory. So will that present um, an economic or geographic challenge then? Because if you lose access to what is which currently fished, that will become EU EU waters. Uh, what, what what impact would it be from that? I, th I think that is going to form the crux of the negotiations. Now, Northern Ireland Ministry is very, very, very clear on, on what it wants in terms of access to EU waters, and we're very, very clear in, in terms of uh, what we are prepared to concede. Um, there is plenty in that for, for a sensible negotiation that, that leads towards a fair outcome for all parties to be achieved. So, I am not unduly concerned that if the EU come to negotiations with good faith that, that, that a workable solution uh, can't be reached. I, I'm confident that, that we can get there for, for, for everyone's benefit. As far as the issues of guarantees are concerned, I think we've had plenty of assurances but no guarantees. Uh, we do draw some comfort from the fact that Fishing is so far up the flagpole now that it would be a hugely uh, embarrassing for, for, for any politician to, to try and, or uh, any Conservative government to try and uh, pull it down. So we take some comfort from that, but again, uh, not guaranteed. On the issue of devolved uh, administrations, yes, there's a threat, but there's also opportunities. Uh, so for, for, so for example, if, if we look back to the bill and the environmental and sustainability and climate change opportunities uh, it offers us. 
we certainly feel that there's far more can be achieved if we bring those in-house to Northern Ireland than there can be if we leave uh, the UK government to make the decisions. The issue the UK government has with this is to try and, uh, and promote a one-size-fits-all uh, approach, and that really doesn't work for fishermen and it doesn't work for ENGOs and it leaves everyone hugely frustrated with, uh, with, with what they're trying to achieve in the environmental field because it doesn't meet the aim. Where when we do it in Northern Ireland, again, one of the advantages of being a small country is myself and, and, and Alan and uh, the appropriate people in the department sit around the table with a chart and a ruler and we draw up boxes and we, we all agree and we all leave either equally unhappy or, or equally unhappy but sensible compromises are reached and effective measures can be achieved. So by bringing the likes of environmental and sustainability and conservation issues into a devolved administration, you're actually sometimes far better able to achieve a result. Yes. Now, thank you. If I may just, Vice Chair, come back to the issue of, of guarantees. Um, the fear, and sold out if I can put it that way, Mr Blair, is not unique to the UK. This is, a, this is an issue that applies across Europe's fishing fleets as well. And uh, when, when I speak to colleagues in the Republic of Ireland, for example, they've got the same fear from their side. And uh, one of the examples that they'll use is, well, Alan, do you really think uh, that the Dublin government is, is, uh, is going to sacrifice one billion pounds, billion euros worth of red meat trade across to England for the sake of the fishing industry? So they've got that fear too. Actually, the comfort that I've taken over the past couple of weeks is in First of all, what was contained in the, in the draft commission negotiating guidelines uh, or mandate for the for the trade deal, and then what became uh, the, the, the final version. Because in the draft, when it came to the fisheries section, the language that was used implied that the EU side accepted that there was going to be change. There was going to be a, a new equilibrium. Now, clearly, when member states got their hands on it, the language was reinforced. I would suggest, Mr Vice Chair, that the Commission um, and Mr Barnier, having been through um, a round of negotiations already, has been more realistic about what the final outcome will, will be, um, and there will be change, which will be positive for us. Okay. Well, I think that's everybody that's wanting to ask a question has asked it, so I, I want to thank uh, Alan and Harry for coming along and making that presentation. It was very useful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So our next item then is oral evidence from the NI Marine Task Force on the Fisheries Bill. So members will find the briefing paper at pages 267 to 271. Are all our guests here? I will. Then Marion will just get them there. Okay. There's one of them here anyway. from the uh, Marine Task Force Officer of John Martin, Head of Policy from the RSBB, Rebecca Hunter, Chair of Marine and Fisheries Group, Ulster Wildlife Trust, and Dr. Kenneth Ode, uh, Marine Policy Officer of the RSBB. I hope I got everybody's name right there. So we just kind of advise you to have 10 minutes uh, to brief the committee and then we'll take questions thereafter. Um, so thank you for the introduction um, and thank you committee members for the invitation to provide evidence this afternoon. To start with a brief introduction, um, the Northern Ireland Marine Task Force is a coalition of environmental organisations working to achieve healthy, productive and resilient seas for Northern Ireland. Our work areas include marine protection, marine planning and sustainable fisheries and we are leading the marine and fisheries element of the Northern Ireland Environment Links Brexit Coalition. You've already received our written evidence so I'll just give a short briefing on our key points. As an island nation our seas and marine wildlife are at the heart of our culture, well-being and prosperity. 
We all rely on a healthy marine environment, which provides us with multiple resources and services, including food, raw materials, transport and energy. Our seas play a key role in reducing climate stress through carbon regulation and storage. They provide coastal protection and opportunities for tourism and recreation, as well as physical and mental health benefits, cultural heritage and learning experiences. But our seas are in trouble. Last year, a global UN biodiversity assessment stated that approximately 66% of the marine environment has been significantly altered by human actions. It also identified that while overfishing is a threat to the health of our marine environment, our seas are under increasing pressure from a wide range of stressors, such as pollution, invasive species and climate change. Further assessments at UK and Northern Ireland scales have also shown decreases in many of our native species and habitats. The development of a new fisheries management regime for the UK represents a window of opportunity to revisit the way in which we manage our fishing and contribute to the wider health of our seas. We welcome the UK's aspiration to become a world leader in fisheries management. Following the end of the transition period at the end of this year, the UK will become an independent coastal state. The UK Fisheries Bill has therefore, therefore been brought forward to replace the EU Common Fisheries Policy, which has driven UK and devolved fisheries management over recent decades. We broadly welcome the Fisheries Bill as a piece of framework legislation which aims to deliver sustainable fisheries management alongside a healthy marine environment. We welcome the eight fisheries objectives contained in the bill, in particular the sustainability, precautionary, ecosystem and scientific evidence objectives. This new iteration of the bill also includes encouraging objectives which will help fisheries to mitigate and adapt to climate change and minimise the incidental bycatch of sensitive species such as seabirds and dolphins. The detailed arrangements regarding how these fisheries objectives will be achieved across the UK will be agreed jointly between the Secretary of State and devolved administrations with input from stakeholders. This will be published as a joint fishery statement within 18 months of the bill passing. We, as the Northern Ireland Marine Task Force, have been involved in an initial DEFRA workshop um, under the previous version of the bill and look forward to represent the Northern Ireland environment sector in future discussions. On the face of it, the bill shows ambition to manage fisheries in an environmentally sustainable way. However, we have serious concerns that these ambitions do not have the legal underpinning to deliver this aim. We believe that aspirations in the bill can only be secured if there is a legal duty on fisheries policy authorities to achieve the fisheries objectives. In addition, there must be a legal commitment to fish at scientifically sustainable levels. We believe fisheries management plans should be introduced for all commercially exploited stocks and any other depleted fish stocks. It is crucial that there is a strong approach to the sustainable management of shared stocks, for example those between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. A commitment to implement remote electronic monitoring for any vessel fishing, fishing within UK waters must also be made. This will help to gather a true picture of what is being caught in our seas and provide improved data for effective management. We believe that stakeholder engagement is vital to the development of fisheries management and we recommend that the department develops a Northern Ireland discussion paper alongside the development of the joint fisheries statement across the UK to identify any potential gaps in Northern Ireland legislation and policy in order to ensure that we deliver on our commitments to the UK fisheries objectives. While the Fisheries Bill creates a new UK management regime, we must remain committed to meeting our international legal obligations, notably provisions under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and Goal 14 of the UN Sustainable Development Goals to conserve and sustainably manage the oceans. If the UK sets fishing opportunities above sustainable levels, it will fail to implement these international legal obligations. It's important to note that the issues that we have raised in our written briefing previously have been tabled as amendments and are currently being debated within the House of Lords. This week, the Lords have debated the need for sustainability to be at the heart of the bill, stating that if you don't have environmental sustainability, neither do you have social and economic sustainability. 
As I mentioned previously, our marine environment is facing multiple pressures and we believe it is important to place the Fisheries Bill within the wider context of necessary marine recovery. As a priority, the completion of a well-managed network of protected areas at sea within Northern Ireland would benefit our wider environment and secure protection of essential fish habitats such as seagrass meadows. Finally, as the process to develop new fisheries management system continues, we would welcome the opportunity to provide further briefings and evidence to the committee relating both to these discussions and on wider marine issues to help to ensure that Northern Ireland's marine environment is restored and resilient for our future generations. Thank you for listening and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay, we'll just move around the members. John, you've indicated do you want to speak first? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I'll take off, I'm sure there'll be others. Can I, I thank you, Rebecca, for that and, uh, presentation and all of you for, for this paper and, and other papers you have brought to us. Uh, the, the, you've mentioned in, in your uh, paper presentation to us that you're um, very keen that are uh, in any review of Northern Ireland fisheries policy should also be done alongside um, the work on the joint fisheries statement and that the two should be taken in tandem, as it were. Uh, and I understand that completely. Um, thinking immediately, how do, how do we best um, bring that to DERA and, and try and progress that, and at the same time try and tie in uh, clear links with departments like infrastructure? Do it have a say on major planning applications? Uh, uh, along our coasts, and, and uh, I think we're, we're all aware of, of some of those. And also, obvious uh, Department for Economy, who would have a role to play. Um, well, we can certainly explore that as representatives here, but I'm, I'm keen to know if you've done some of those approaches or made some of those approaches already, and if you have, how best we can assist in progressing them. I think um, the way we have been working previously on uh, work around new fisheries management was taken forward under the DERA's Brexit Fisheries Stakeholder Group, which was a group composed of representatives from the department, from industry and from the environment sector. Um, and it was a very it was a very useful group and it, it worked well. Um, one of the, the main output from that group was the development of a joint position paper on the future of Northern Ireland fisheries, which was sent to the then Secretary of State, Michael Gove. This was back in 2018. I think because of the, the sort of um, situation of government in, in Westminster and, and the fisheries bill just coming forward earlier this year, that group hasn't met since that position paper was put forward, but it was a really good forum for the stakeholders to engage. We currently don't have a forum to engage outside of the DERA. Um, so probably my, my initial thoughts to that would be to the, the, the stakeholder groups already existing between the department, the industry and our environment sector work well. Um, but that actually a potential to engage with other interested departments would be really useful. Just, just to add to that, I guess, um, looking across the piece on other bills that are currently live, so the obvious one is the Environment okay. Bill, um, and it was great to hear the previous uh, presenters um, looking towards conservation, biodiversity, climate change, etc., being integrated into future um, uh, legislation on, on fisheries um, and being able to do that for Northern Ireland. Um, so it's important to remember that these bills don't act in isolation, that, they do, that there is read across between those other bills. In particular, the Environment um, Act and Environment Bill that is currently getting scrutiny in Westminster. Um, and we've been up previously talking yeah. about that and the, the Office of Environmental Protection that may apply, giving some additional scrutiny um, to government on the delivery of environmental commitments. So um, we would expect um, the marine environment to be another element within that that they would look at um, and provide some level of governance uh, for the marine environment as well, which would have read across to, to fisheries too. And to other departments, across departments, yeah. <clears throat> i just add to that as, as well, um, just to touch on marine planning. Fishing is within our marine plan at the moment, which remains in draft. Um, and obviously the marine plan cuts across various departments and will require sign off at executive level. Um, and I think as that plan continues to be developed, that's a really good opportunity um, for other departments, other stakeholders to feed into that 
um, and fishing is included within the marine plan um, and that's a kind of holistic way of, of looking at, at the different activities in the marine environment. Uh, and Chair, Chair, just to clarify that the reason for asking that is that, and I'm sure the panel are aware of the reasons, um, is because if you have a fisheries plan and that's well and good, it may be a very commendable plan to protect what is out there in the water. Um, we need to be very mindful that another department might be considering an application that pumps something out into that water and could have a detrimental effect. Hey John, um, so I want to just uh, pick up on something that was discussed earlier, and just looking for your views on it. We heard from a researcher from contribution earlier about the legal uh, dispute over the ownership of, of Loch Foy and how this has created a legislative lim limbo in terms of the Loch Agency being unable to um, effectively wean their powers. Do you have any assessment of the impact this will have for uh, aquaculture or the, the management of the Loch? So I'll, uh, I'll answer that one if I may, Chair. Um, yeah, we have been raising this issue uh, for quite some time now. Uh, we raised this uh, whenever we discussed the implications of Brexit on the fishing industry in a previous inquiry at Westminster. Um, um, we have concern around Loch Foyle and its status, as it were, for uh, as a disputed water. Um, there is no border, uh, as you're aware, in the loch, uh, and that does flag some issues and some risk issues in terms of future management. Um, we don't necessarily have the answer as to how that's going to be resolved, um, but we believe that there are some, or we know that there are some uh, significant industries in that area. There's also some significant wildlife in that area in terms of reserves that require management uh, and will need management uh, put in place uh, in order to meet the objectives of those sites. Uh, and we would uh, encourage um, that dialogue is had over how, to, how we uh, get across this issue uh, to go forward because that border issue has been an issue in the likes of marine planning where the border is not marked on the Northern Ireland Draft Marine Plan uh, and we think that it, uh, it could potentially exacerbate in the future. So we do believe it is a high priority. Um, could you tell me, see in relation to um, curling for lock, is, is it is it does similarly marine spy lock savings? It is similarly managed by Lock Agency on a catchment based approach. Uh -huh. uh, Carlingford Lock has a slightly different uh, set of circumstances in that there is a, an agreement as such to a border that runs down the uh, shipping channel. It just uh -huh. conveniently happens to be pretty much in the centre of Carlingford Lock. Mm -hmm. um, and that has allowed the designation of sites in the past. Uh, however, in Lock Foyle, uh, a border it hasn't been agreed in any sort of form of uh, neighbourhood agreement or gentleman's agreement to a border. So Carlingford has a s slight progression in that in that respect, um, but not in Loch Foyle. Chair, uh, if you don't mind, um, just look into the protocol. Um, yeah. And although this is untested, um, will be something that will, will come into play here, yeah. probably on North-South cooperation. So Article 11, um, paragraph 1 uh, states maintain the necessary conditions for continued north-south cooperation including in the areas of environment, health, agriculture, transport, education, tourism, etc, etc, etc. So um, there, are, there is some potential alliance for this kind of continued cooperation um, but it doesn't specifically mention uh, marine or fisheries environment within mm. there and uh, the protocol because it is untested um, you know, is, is we're still not sure as to whether mm. it will be effective means of governance or not. So it does mention the environment in general, um, and there are other bits of it, uh, Article 16 in particular, about um, governance again. But um, as we said, you know, it's 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 untested to date, so we don't know on how, how effective it may be. Thank you very much. Um, who have we got? Claire. Claire. Thank you, Chair. And. Thank you for, for being here. Um, maybe we want to look at, uh, get your thoughts on, again, it's been touched on there as well, it, how do you think this bill fits with the Environment Bill? I mean, they are intrinsically linked in the rollout of them, um, but sitting as two standalone bills, and it's something mm -hmm. I asked of the department earlier, and while there was an acknowledgement that the two are coming together, you know, this fact we're still in 2020 and we're only thinking, oh, these are coming together now, you know, but just I, I'm assuming you've went through them in great detail. And what would your thoughts be there? Uh, I, I can take that one. Um, so I suppose um, 
The Environment Bill, as we know, is mostly for England. Um, Northern Ireland are taking powers within the bill um, because of where we are, where we were at that point in time. So, um, because the Assembly was down, um, there was a move to take powers in Northern Ireland to ensure that the governance gap was filled, at least in part, between us leaving the EU and starting up whatever new um, environmental governance. Uh, uh, institutions that were required moving forward. Um, so there's nothing specific within the Environment Bill um, relating uh, necessarily to the marine environment, but it's more of a holistic uh, view of the environment in general. So we would like to think that um, any of the clauses that were relating to Northern Ireland would both uh, be for both terrestrial and marine uh, biodiversity and environmental governance. Um, our preference, I guess, um, moving forward in Northern Ireland would be that the environment strategy in Northern Ireland, uh, which we have, uh, which the department has consulted on and taken views on, um, covers in equal measure both ter terrestrial and marine um, biodiversity. And we have um, we have some information within that. Um, NIMTF responded to that, as did um, the the wider NGO sector. So we can forward those responses to the committee to get a bit of a view on on. A more detailed view on how I would expect that to look uh, going forward, um, and any legislation um, that may or may not be developed uh, on the environment strategy, um, we would like to see you know the marine environment contained within that as well. Great, thank you. If I could uh, just add, sorry, Claire, um, within the environment bill, we have the environmental improvement plans, um, as John has mentioned, of which the environment strategy may be our first. Um, I think what's key with the fisheries bill, um, we've got our eight objectives um, and it's really important that the environmental improvement plan is consistent and coherent with those objectives um, and also that the fisheries management plans that are contained uh, within the fisheries bill, that they are you know, referenced within our future environment strategy. Um, so really we're looking for a strong level of coherency between the two yeah. um, and obviously we're welcome working with the department um, on the development of that strategy as it goes forward and, and making sure that there is a good read across between both bills. I want to go back to maybe just tease out your thoughts a wee bit more um, on the electronic um, monitoring um, and how you think that could work. Um, I know you've address that in your briefing paper, um, but it really sort of got into the robust monitoring and enforcement elements of it as well. Um, how do you see that working? Would that be per pervasive? And yep. do you think we're capable? Are we ready for it? Yes, so um, remote electronic monitoring is a fisheries management tool um, and essentially what it is, it is, is it's an array of sensors on the vessel um, and also video cameras. Um, we would like to see it rolled out across all UK vessels, um, but also importantly within the bill that any vessels that are fishing within UK waters, that they have the same requirement um, and that they would have OREM and CCTV on board. Um, it is becoming, um, I suppose, a, a world leading best practice fisheries management tool. Um, and within Northern Ireland, um, using technology for monitoring enforcement is really coming into the narrative. So the department are looking at rolling out a pilot trial of IVMS, an inshore vessel monitoring system, um, and it's essentially OREM adds additional sensors onto that. Um, and in terms of a data collection tool as well, it's, it's, it's quite important. Um, and it has been shown in pilots in New Zealand, um, Australia, America, to be quite cost effective um, as well. We have our, our future grant schemes. Um, so when we finish with the European Maritime Fisheries Fund at the end of this year, we'll have new national grants. Um, so there could be a funding mechanism there for rolling it out, for helping with the rollout on vessels. I think just to say the point on REM, because the fisheries bill is, is a Westminster bill, we're working through the Greener UK Coalition, which is a UK-wide coalition of environmental organisations, um, and remote electronic monitoring is one of the key asks across the Greener UK Coalition and has been tabled for debate in the Lords this week as well. I don't think it's come up yet, but it's, it has been listed as an amendment that will be debated. Great. Thank you. Okay, okay, Claire. Um, oh, first, there's a couple of the things that um, I just mentioned here. Seeing, just picking up the chair, I see in relation to the the fisheries man, man, the fisheries management plan, and I, I know that uh, 
the, the buzzword and the circles now is the whole idea of co-production and co-design. So has the department engaged with yourselves in terms of trying to sort of design in that draft plan or have you any uh, assessment of where it's at at the moment? So I think the, the plan is that within the joint fisheries statement any existing fisheries management plans will be listed and then the, the other stocks Currently, the, the bill asks for other stocks that the department intends to bring forward. Fisheries management plans also need to be listed. But our ask here is that all stocks that are, are commercially targeted or other depleted fish stocks should all be listed. So this is still a piece of work that needs to begin. We, we sit currently on the Inshore Fisheries Partnership Group, which is a, a forum for discussing fisheries management issues with the department and with um, industry. But so far, any of these new fisheries management plans haven't yet been um, been brought forward. Mm -hmm. But like we said, we have previously been involved in DEFRA, UK-wide stakeholder workshops on the development of the joint fisheries statement. And what we're expecting is that these workshops will begin again now that the bill has returned. Um, and it will be during these workshops that we'll begin to see exactly what will be included within mm. each fisheries management plan and, mm. and put, have input into that. And just uh, finally, just looking for your, your view or, your, or indeed your knowledge, um, I was um, surprised earlier when we got some evidence from the, um, the Fisheries Harbour Authority that they're currently contending with seven abandoned vessels in their, in their the harbours. Um, and there's a legislative gap as regards to how they should be uh, decommissioned and disposed of. You know, presumably there would be, um, amongst many other things, an environmental impact from that there. Are, are you, have you any suggestions what would be the best practice to deal with those? And do you have any um, uh, evidence of what happens in other jurisdictions or areas about how uh, these uh, are dealt with or are decommissioned in such situations? I'll maybe take that one. Um, it's a very interesting question. I, I think um, we we wouldn't have evidence of, of what that procedure might be uh, in other areas. Uh, there would be issues around uh, around what we do in terms of waste management, in a way. Um, uh, but it does have an environmental impact. Uh, but I think it's key that uh, we are moving into uh, a new a new process of how we manage our, fish, our fisheries and this is a, a classic example of an issue that we think needs to be brought to the table and we're not, we're not convinced that, or at least we haven't seen evidence of how this how the issues in this in the bill and other issues that affect the marine environment and the industry in relation to fisheries are brought to the table mm -hmm. and, and that's why we feel that it's that we would encourage the department to consider putting together a discussion paper um, that would there would be a tool that would be developed alongside the joint fisheries statement that would allow them to consult on issues like the one you've just mo just mentioned uh, and would bring uh, a range of stakeholders around the table to work out how it's best to deliver the objectives, uh, how we feel the objectives should be delivered and how we develop other policy tools like the fisheries management plans. Mm -hmm. Just, just to add, Chair, you know, that wouldn't be allowed with cars, so why, you know, would it be allowed in yeah. the marine environment? <coughs> sure. um, also then, um, we listened to the, the evidence earlier and um, the commitment towards the polluter pays principle, yeah. which we would support as well. Um, so just to add those last two comments. Thank you. Morris? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Thanks very much for your presentation. Uh, I know it's vital that stocks are, are, are fished in a sustainable way, and, and I'd be keen to see how that rolls out as this, this progress uh, develops. But the migration of fish, particularly the Atlantic salmon and the sea trout, is a, is a concern of mine as a, a recreational angler from the shore, I suppose, who's never caught one. Uh, <laughs> but uh, fishing plants should protect the commercial exotic stocks, especially depleted stocks. Have you any? Implementation, implementation time frame, how that can be achieved? I think in terms of a time frame, that would be very stock and species specific. Um, and that's actually one of the things why we, we really are very supportive of, of this new 
um, idea around fisheries management plans because fisheries management is not one size fits all. It, it depends exactly on the conditions of, of a particular time of year, of the biology of a particular species, and that even that changes depending on what part of the UK that, that species is found. Um, so by taking that very detailed and close look um, about all of those matters, um, I think would allow that. I think in terms of a time frame, it's the balance between being realistic in, in what is achievable and also having the sort of biology feed into that and a lot of the best science feed into that in terms of how actually, how, what are the growth rates of this species, um, what is the current recruitment levels, how fast is the stock likely to, um, to be restored, um, and then looking at the potential measures that can be brought in. And I think that's something that on a stock by stock basis we would, we would sort of welcome being involved in with the other stakeholders in the process. Can I just be quick one? Yeah, we're right. What, what, what financial commitment uh, would be required to develop a plan to have sustainable fisheries and marine ecosystems? Yeah. What's the cost? So we don't have a, a cost analysis of mm -hmm. that. Um, I'm sure other NGOs um, across the UK might, might be working on that. Um, what we would like to see is that at the moment we have um, about 26 million euro of EMFF funding currently, which runs out at the end of this year. Um, that also has a €6 million Euro, um, additional national contribution. Um, I think it's vital, especially as we look at you know, this kind of new way of managing our fisheries, um, that in the next national grant scheme that we have that will kick off next year, um, that there is enough money dedicated to rolling out, developing these fisheries management plans, um, and also the wider issues um, in the marine environment that need to be resourced. Um, so yeah, we will wait and, wait and see what's in the pot there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, we've got Claire. Oh, thanks. Back again. <laughs> um, and Rebecca, you may have mentioned of, of, of pollution and it didn't go into any details, but just do you have any levels or any information on levels of pollution in our waters? There's just a wee one that come up. Um, not just plastic, you know, plastic pollution gets the, the headlines at the minute. Um, but you know, there's a lot of other damage and pollution going on. And at the end of your briefing paper, one of your next stage calls is asking for the minister to produce um, a fisheries discussion paper. Has that been asked of the minister, or have the department engaged with that idea? So, um, for on the pollution, I, I don't have specific figures to mind at the minute, but I know that in addition to, I think it's something like. Uh, 6,300 um, pieces of, of plastic found per kilometre around our, our shores in the last marine litter survey. So the problem is getting, uh, it's intensifying, and, and that was up for about 43% on the previous year. A better um, chance of catching a plastic bottle, Morris, yeah. maybe? <laughs> um, <laughs> a lot better. better. <laughs> Um, but in addition to that, we also do water framework directive um, reporting, or the department does water framework directive reporting, um, and currently the um, status of marine water bodies around Northern Ireland, I think it's about 60% of them are in moderate or poor status. Um, so there is, that's just runoff from the land, um, so it is an, an issue, and that then to link in with the discussion paper, you know, whenever we're looking at fisheries management, the idea of a, an ecosystem-based approach is that you're looking at all of the, the pressures on the marine environment, not just one um, area in particular. Um, with the fisheries discussion paper, it's being brought to the department, but we haven't yet brought it to the minister, although we do have a meeting with the minister um, scheduled. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, just add to that. Um, there's nothing specific in the bill itself around pollution measures, um, um, but what there is, uh, as Ellen was mentioning earlier, is that the, the funding from EMFF can be used um, to address pollution issues. And one example of that is the Fishing for Litter scheme that has been ongoing in Northern Ireland, and that is where, where fishermen land plastic that they catch uh, in their, as, as bycatch as such. Uh, so that's an example of where funding can be used to deliver on pollution objectives, and that's something we'd like to see uh, continued. Thank you. Again, sorry, Chair, just looking forward. Um, elements within the protocol 
that may or may not help with some of this and um, previous comments on it being untested are you know still ring true with all of this so um, article 16 on safeguards uh, talks about the application of the protocol leads to serious economic societal or environmental difficulties that are liable to persist um, or diversion of trade the union or the united kingdom may unilaterally take appropriate safeguard measures so for any of these bits of legislation that are coming through westminster um, there's another element that needs to be looked through the lens of the protocol um, and it's really important I think that um, both the NGOs and the Assembly you know, get to grips with exactly how this is going to work um, because this is going to be our, the new future for Northern Ireland. Okay. John? Quick one, sure. I'm wondering here if, you're, if your own record of catching fish is any better than Morris's. <laughs> well, I was going to say to you, I know, I know from my previous life in a, in a, in a different world, uh, and job that, that at least your enthusiasm was there for you anyway. Uh, right, the, the, um, the, the issues raised here about um, litter and pollution and all of things are very, very relevant indeed. And it's quite shocking that, that you know a discarded uh, ship or boat or vessel in the water isn't being treated with the same seriousness as an abandoned car would be either there or on land. Um, and I think all of us here genuinely take a note of that. Um, but Se separate to that, uh, species protection, I, I know that we haven't been into the detail of this in your report, so if you don't have the answer today, that's fine. But as we as we look forward in that regard as well, should there be any species uh, in particular or more than others that we would be should be concerned about uh, preserving? Yes, preserving. So um, at the minute, uh, the department has created a list of um, sort of species of conservation importance, um, a list to be designated under the marine conservation zones, um, and we uh, there was actually an assessment of the Northern Ireland's current network of marine protected areas that was conducted by JNCC, the Joint Nature Conservation Committee. They're the sort of UK advisors um, to government on conservation matters. So that assessment was carried out of the Northern Ireland network and the Marine Task Force actually conducted its own um, assessment of that as well. So we're in agreement that um, there are still gaps remaining within our current Northern Ireland network. Um, some species such as the native oyster is one of those gaps and that's something which you know, I think it's useful to bring to the, the committee's attention that the issues that you've discussed today around Loch Foyle, yep. the, the lack of yep. um, a boundary within Loch Foyle has stalled the designation of marine protected areas in that in that site as well. So our first priority would be that the uh, protected area network is completed and the remaining gaps um, within that network are filled. Um, it's then also key to consider that the, the species which currently are protected through um, marine protected areas, only 4.48% of our marine protected area network is under favourable management. So these protected areas you know, need to have management plans in place so that the necessary measures to um, protect and restore those species is being taken. Yeah, yeah. I'm just uh, to add, um, so the delegation last week talked about the State of Nature report, um, which uh, came out last year um, and stated that 272 species in Northern Ireland are at risk um, of extinction. Uh, so that's about uh, 11 or 12 per cent. Um, that's not broken down into marine uh, species, but I'm sure we could probably do that and provide that to the committee. But Kenny might want to say a wee bit more about uh, seabirds in particular. Yeah, so. Um it is uh, the issue around um, highly mobile species is something that is, has troubled our our production of management plans. Mm -hmm. um, and Rebecca is absolutely right that uh, there are still gaps, uh, and we're happy to share our assessment of those gaps uh, with the committee um, in the network. Uh, and we require management plans to be brought in place uh, to consider those. But our species, our seabirds, are. Um, still in decline, unfortunately. Um, for example, the, the puffin was uh, upgraded in the IUCN red list uh, just last year. Uh, and one of the issues we have, just to, if I may bring this back round to sort of the bill and the fisheries uh, uh, bill, is that um, we don't have an assessment of the interaction between the uh, activities of the fishing industry and bycatch uh, of 
and I'm not talking bycatch of, uh, of, of fish as such, but other bycatch issues such as mammals and, and seabirds. Uh, it's something that uh, hasn't been done in Northern Ireland and we would encourage under the Joint Fisheries Statement uh, uh, and under the discussion document uh, consideration of how we uh, assess if there is, if any, um, any impact from uh, what we do at sea in terms of fishing uh, and the bycatch of seabirds and mammals. Actually, if, if I just add, because one of the other things in the fisheries bill is the new climate objective, um, and climate is now being talked about more and more. Um, but I think that when we look at measures to mitigate the impact of the industry on climate um, and to help the, the industry adapt to it, we also need to be conscious to um, protect the current carbon stocks that we have, because if we allow those to be depleted, then that increases our emissions and all of our efforts on another side, you know, it weighs out and it's, it's a bit pointless. So we do have quite a number of what are termed blue carbon habitats in our marine environment. So these are habitats such as seagrass meadows, which store huge amounts of carbon, um, but are also very fragile to um, a lot of human activities. Um, seagrass stores up to 40 times the carbon of forest. Um, so it's a really, really huge, um, huge sort of provider, a huge um, balancing, buffering effect to the, to the climate issue. So blue carbon habitats, the protection of those habitats would be key in also delivering on the climate objective. Just, just to add, Chair, very quickly, if you don't mind. So the previous Environment Committee had a really important role in bringing forward marine legislation in Northern Ireland, and particularly um, the designation of marine conservation zones. Um, so that allowed us to protect some of our most precious um, habitats and species in Northern Ireland, um, including Ocean Quahog and Belfast Lock, and uh, the first um, MCZ for seabirds anywhere in the UK uh, on Rathlin. Um, so you know the, the, the committee and, and the legislators here have a very important role um, in, in maintaining the legacy of those protections, but also growing them where we need them. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I don't know um, for the questions. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you for coming here today and answering all of our questions and um, wish you well. And everything that you have said today will, has been noted and we've hands out and be forwarded to the part of the discussion around the fisheries uh, bill. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, folks. Uh, any other business items you want to raise? No. Okay, next meeting, 12th of March at 10 a.m. or 30. Thank you.